Hello. Hi again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I think everybody <laughs> I think everybody is here now so you can start. Okay, great. Thank you, Katarina. Um thank you all for for coming today. Um I'm really pleased I'm able uh, to do this. Um can I just ask is is the sound okay there? Is is it all okay? Yes, I can hear you. We can all hear you well, I believe. Yeah. Okay. All right. And the picture is okay? Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's not great. All right. Um, well, yeah. So, so thank you for this, uh, for this invitation. I, I'm sorry I, I can't be uh, in, in Croatia. I'm actually sitting in my, uh, I'm sitting in my apartment in uh, Toronto in Canada um, where I live, but, but I'm still very glad to have the, the chance to do um, this uh, uh, a talk, it, it's a bit of an experiment for me. Uh, I've never uh, given a talk using Skype before, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I hope it will work uh, well. Um, okay. Unfortunately, uh, it turns out that you can only see either my slides or me. You can't see both at the same time, so I might have to, to swap backwards and forwards a bit. Can I just ask, um, for my own information, how many people there are... Um, how many of you use Facebook? Any? Everybody, I think. Just raise your hands. Should please raise your hands, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and how many of you regularly use, say, Wikipedia? Okay, so almost everybody. Actually, I should say, I, I don't use Facebook, so, uh, so I would be unusual, I guess, in the room. Um, uh, how many of you read blogs? pretty regularly, say once a week or more. Okay. Um, and how many of you, uh, say, uh, write a blog of your own or have in the past? Any? <laughs> <laughs> a few people looking a bit embarrassed, maybe. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to switch over to the slides, but hopefully you'll continue to hear uh, me. So. I want to go back, you know, we take Wikipedia uh, for granted, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about sort of its origins and just how remarkable it was. So we'll go back to uh, January the 17th, 2001, um, when this man, uh, Larry Sanger, he's a, a philosopher, uh, made the announcement to the world on a mailing list that Wikipedia is up. Uh, so he, you can see here his, his message, I, I hope you can see his message. Uh, it announces the length and says, humor me, go there and add a little article, it will take all of five or ten minutes, Larry. So of course, uh, this worked maybe rather better than they were expecting. Uh, in the English language Wikipedia today, there are more than three million articles. Uh, in the Croatian uh, Wikipedia, there are, I think it's just gone past 100,000 articles, uh, in fact. Uh, and there are Wikipedias in many other languages. Here's the Esperanto Wikipedia, uh, here's the Kokongo uh, Wikipedia. There's about 300 or so different languages represented. So, you know, that obviously turned out a bit better, I think, than Sanger expected. So we go back even further in time, back to August of 1991, and a 21-year-old Finnish student uh, named Linus Torvalds posted a little note to an online mailing list. And you can see what he said. Uh, it was to an operating system mailing list. And he said, I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby, won't be big and professional like GNU for 386 uh, clones, etc., etc." He asks for suggestions and uh, feedback, but won't promise that he'll implement them. So you can get an idea of just how well this was going to go from the fact that 12 minutes later, somebody replied on the mailing list and their first words were, tell us more. Uh, and uh, you know, this really launched uh, interest in what was uh, to become ultimately the multi-billion dollar uh, Linux industry. And when you use you know, services like um, uh, Google or Yahoo uh, today, you, they're running on absolutely gigantic 
uh, uh, clusters of Linux machines. Uh, most Hollywood movies, uh, nearly all Hollywood movies, uh, rendered the computer graphics uh, on Linux machines, for example. They're used in washing machines and television sets and, and whatnot. So given the success of these open source projects, you might ask whether or not it's possible to apply similar open source principles to solve scientific problems. Maybe we can take similar ideas and use them to solve scientific problems. So in January of 2009, uh, this man, Timothy Gowers, uh, a mathematician at Cambridge University um, and also a, a Fields medalist, uh, uh, which is kind of the mathematical equivalent of the Nobel Prize, decided to do an experiment along these lines. And Gowers is not just a, you know, a, a renowned mathematician, uh, he's also a blogger. And on his blog in 2009, he posed a very interesting question. The question was, is massively collaborative mathematics possible? And what he was proposing in this post was to attack a hard mathematical problem completely in the open, using the comments section of his blog as the medium of collaboration. So the idea was that anyone in the world was invited to come along, and if they had an idea relevant to the problem, to just add it as a comment in the comments section of the blog. His hope was that by combining the ideas of many minds in this way, it would be possible to make easy work of his hard mathematical problem. So Gowers dubbed this experiment the Polymath Project. Uh, can I get a show of hands again? H how many of you have, say, uh, taken some classes in mathematics at university? Okay. How many of you would say that you like mathematics? <laughs> a few. How many would say that you hate mathematics? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not going to describe the problem in much detail that he, he had proposed, but just uh, for a couple of minutes, I'll, I'll give you kind of the flavour. Uh, it doesn't actually matter very much. You can turn off if you really dislike mathematics. Uh, but, uh, so it was a, result, a problem called the density hales jewett theorem, or DHJ. It's a problem which Gowers said he would, quote, love to solve. It was a difficult, uh, unsolved uh, problem. To give you the flavour of it, Imagine that you have a three by three board and you fill it in with six pieces as I've shown here. And you'll see that there's no line anywhere um, that, that, that you can draw through three pieces in a row. But if you add an extra piece, a seventh piece, uh, there is a line, three in a row. There's actually two of them. And it doesn't matter how you put seven pieces on the board, it doesn't matter in what configuration, you'll be, you know, a line is forced somewhere. So this sounds, I mean, it's kind of uh, simple and obvious, uh, and who cares? Um, what the density hales jewett theorem does is it considers a generalization of this problem, which turns out to be important. So they generalize in a couple of ways. First of all, instead of having three squares on a side, you have some large, you know, three, four, five, however many squares on a side of your board. And instead of being in two dimensions, this is sort of the tricky bit, it's in n dimensions. And in particular, particularly, uh, excuse me, uh, n can be some very large number. So it might be in a thousand dimensions or 10,000 dimensions. And what the density hales jewett theorem says is that as the number of dimensions gets very, very large, if you fill in even a tiny fraction of the squares, a line is forced somewhere on the board. And this is surprising, and the reason it's surprising is because you know, it, back in two dimensions, we had to fill in almost the entire board before a line is forced. But this is saying that if you fill in even a tiny fraction, in fact, a, a vanishing fraction in, in the limit of very large dimension, you'll have a line forced somewhere, no matter how clever you are in trying to avoid the line. So it's a little bit surprising. In fact, the, the actual result is even a little bit stronger than that. You can actually say something about the type of, of line. And so you, you might say, well, who cares? That sounds boring. Um, but it turns out that this result is actually connected to other important results in mathematics. It's even connected in, in some ways to the distribution of prime numbers, believe it or not. 
So I can't explain that, but this is kind of, it should give you some of the motivation why these top mathematicians were interested in the question. Anyway, that's enough about the problem. Let's get back to the polymath project, the process. So Gowers opened the conversation up on his blog on February the 1st. And at first, things were pretty quiet. Nobody commented for seven hours. But then a mathematician named Joseph Solomosi from the University of British Columbia made a suggestion. And 15 minutes after that, a high school teacher from Arizona named Jason Dyer made a comment. And just three minutes after that, another uh, mathematician, Terence Tao, uh, made a suggestion of his own. In fact, over the next 37 days, 27 different contributors would write 800 mathematical comments containing 170,000 words. Gowers described the process as being to normal research as driving is to pushing a car. And at the end of that time, at the end of the 37 days, Gowers posted to his blog to say that the problem had most likely uh, been solved uh, and describing it as one of the most exciting six weeks of my mathematical life. So, in fact, they needed to do months more clean-up work and writing of papers and whatnot, but indeed, they had, in fact, solved not just the original problem, but actually a harder generalisation. And it ultimately led uh, to uh, two scientific uh, papers. OK, so, so that's the Polymath Project. I want to take a step back um, and talk a little bit more broadly about science and the way science is done. So we have these remarkable uh, scientific journals. You know, if, if you're a, a scientist uh, and you make a discovery, you write up that discovery and, and publish it in a, uh, a journal article in Nature or Cell, cell or, or, or wherever. In some sense, this is a kind of a collective long-term memory for our, our civilization, for, for human beings. You know, we, we share this knowledge in common and it's been tremendously useful for our civilization. You can go back to 1665 and look at the first scientific journals then, the, the first two scientific journals, and, and look at the results uh, in those journals. What the internet is doing through uh, things like the Polymath Project is it's giving us an opportunity to create a collective short-term working memory a kind of a conversational commons for the rapid collaborative development of ideas. And this goes way beyond scientific uh, journals and enables new collaborative processes, like the Polymath Project, which actually change the way in which knowledge is constructed. So in the case of the Polymath Project, although we, the human race, already had all the expertise necessary to solve the DHJ problem, in some sense that expertise was lying latent. What happened, what the, what the blog and the other tools used by the polymaths did was that those online tools actually coordinated the attention of the people involved all over the world in a new way, activating that latent expertise. Or to put it a different way, what those tools did is they restructured expert attention. They restructured the expertise of the people involved. And that's important because expert attention is often the most important scarce resource in solving creative problems. You know, if, if you were a physicist and you wanted to solve a problem about relativity, what, what would you give to be able to talk to Albert Einstein on it? You want his expertise, you want his expert attention. Um, and, and that's what happened in the case of the Polymath Project. The right people were brought in at the right time. So if we can allocate expert attention more effectively we can actually extend our problem-solving ability. And we start to see what's possible uh, with the Polymath Project. So th the Polymath Project, though, is, is really just a small part of a much bigger transformation, and, and that's my subject today. It's a, a transformation in how discoveries are made by new tools for sharing ideas and data on the network. So as a second example, I want to talk about the Galaxy Zoo Project. Uh, can it, you put up your hand if anybody's familiar with Galaxy Zoo? Anybody? Nope? Okay. So Galaxy Zoo, it, it's a website, and really what it is is a cosmological census. So what they're doing is they're recruiting online volunteers. Here's some of them who got together for a party at the Royal Observatory in London. And, and they're recruiting those volunteers 
uh, at least initially, to classify galaxy images. So you go to the Galaxy Zoo website and you'll be shown a picture of a galaxy and you'll be asked questions about it. It might be a very simple question like, is it spiral or is it elliptical? And the reason why they're doing this is because there are these amazing robotic telescopes um, that have taken millions of galaxy images, far too many, in fact, for individual astronomers to look through and classify on uh, their own. They just don't have the time. And unfortunately, you'd, you'd think, okay, so you'd use computer algorithms uh, to do the classification, but it, in fact, humans' the eyesight still surpasses the best computers at doing that kind of classification. So they had the idea that maybe they could recruit human volunteers to help out with this kind of classification. So they've recruited 250,000 volunteers who have done more than 150 million classifications, at least initially, of a sample of about a million galaxies. So to give you some idea of what this is leading to, um, let me describe one of the early discoveries they made. It was a discovery made by just a, one of the participants in the Galaxy Zoo, a Dutch school teacher named Hanny van Arkel. So she's a 26-year-old uh, school teacher. And she was classifying galaxies on Galaxy Zoo when she noticed, uh, I hope you can, can see this uh, uh, on the screen, there's a galaxy here she was looking at, and she noticed that there was a funny blue blob uh, below the galaxy. Can people see it? I, I... Yes. Yes, you can? Great. And uh, she had the presence of mind to think, well, this is a bit strange, and she posted on the forum to say, what's the blue stuff below? Well, there were many people reading the forum post, including some professional astronomers, but actually no one knew. And so they got some extra uh, data. They, they actually used a different telescope to take a closer look, and they determined that the blue blob was at about the same distance as the galaxy, so it suggested it was neighbouring the, the galaxy. It also suggested, you know, that it wasn't just a, you know, it's not an artefact in the image, uh, and it's also, it must be very, very large. You know, the galaxy is maybe 100,000 light years across, so this must be tens of thousands of light years across. So we have a giant blue cloud of gas or glowing gas or something out there, and nobody in the world knows, you know, what exactly uh, it is. This intrigued quite a few people, and uh, some follow-up observations were scheduled on, on many different telescopes, including the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, uh, ultimately, a, a theory took uh, shape that it was actually a quasar light mirror. So the idea is that about 100,000 years ago, this galaxy um, contained uh, an incredibly bright quasar and nearby was a dwarf galaxy that was getting lit up very brightly by, uh, the, uh, by the quasar. And uh, uh, basically what we're seeing now is we were seeing uh, kind of the afterglow. It was heating up gas in the galaxy and we're seeing that, that, that afterglow. For reasons unknown, the quasar has since uh, turned off. So that's kind of the theory that, that, that they came up with, at least initially. And they, they published a paper about it. Uh, the, the object has actually been named after Hanny. It's called Hanny's Vorwerp, which is apparently the Dutch word for object. And uh, Hanny was a, uh, a uh, uh, author on uh, the paper. Uh, there have been a whole bunch of papers actually by different groups now studying these Vorwerp uh, objects. And Galaxy Zoo has even started a sub-project uh, to do uh, Vorwerp uh, hunting, and they found a bunch more. So all in all, uh, Galaxy Zoo has resulted in 22 different scientific uh, papers, including the papers on the Vorwerp. Just to give you an idea of kind of the participants involved, I'll, I'll just let me tell you a little bit about one. So this is a woman named Aida Burges. Uh, she's from the Dominican Republic. She now lives in Puerto Rico. She's a 53-year-old uh, grandmother of two, and she classifies, typically, uh, about 500 galaxies a week, plus does many forum posts, plus participates in several side projects. Uh, she says of how she got involved was that she, uh, she went uh, to CNN. She was looking at the CNN website and just reading news, and she, she heard about Galaxy Zoo. And she then went to Galaxy Zoo, and her life changed forever. It was like coming home for me. So amongst the discoveries that she's made, uh, she's discovered two of what are called hypervelocity stars. 
So these are stars that are moving out of the Milky Way galaxy incredibly fast, uh, so fast they're not actually gravitationally bound to the galaxy, that one day they'll, they'll drift off into you know, Andromeda or, or wherever. And so these, these stars were first discovered uh, in, uh, just a few years ago, and there's about 20 known, of which she's the discoverer of two. So I think these sorts of citizen science initiatives like Galaxy Zoo are very interesting examples of a new type of bridging institution between the scientific community uh, and society as a whole. And there are other such bridging institutions enabled by online tools. Uh, uh, Katerina uh, works for Intech, an open access scientific publisher, and that's another example of uh, uh, kind of a, a new type of bridging institution which is changing the relationship between the scientific community and society as a whole. And there are many more such institutions. Science blogs are, are certainly one which allow people who otherwise wouldn't be able necessarily to, to, to meet scientists or to, to know very much about them uh, to get some sense of what it's like to be uh, a scientist. And potentially we, could, we can create uh, many more. So if you're an optimist, and, and I'm certainly an optimist, you, you might hope to see through you know, things such as Galaxy Zoo and, and the Polymath Project an, an explosion in the rate of scientific project, progress. But there's a problem, and that is that many of the most interesting and, and promising ideas are actually failing. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the failures and why those failures are occurring. So let me talk uh, a bit about a site called uh, the Quickie. Uh, the Quickie, it, it stands for Quantum Wiki. And the, it was developed by a graduate student at Caltech named uh, John Stockton. And his idea was, it's, it's a very good idea, that maybe you could develop something for the field of quantum computing that's sort of like uh, Wikipedia, but instead of being for general knowledge, it would be for the latest research knowledge in quantum computing. So it'd be kind of a, almost a super textbook, very rapidly evolving um, for uh, you know, information about, about quantum computing, information on the big open problems, people's ideas about how to solve those problems, and so on. So I, I happened to be at the workshop uh, where the quickie was announced, and a lot of people, well, some people were skeptical, but many people were very enthused about the idea. They thought it would be great to have such a resource. Unfortunately, while they thought it would be great to have such a resource, that didn't mean that they wanted to take the time themselves to contribute. They were instead hoping that somebody else would take the lead. And so ultimately, the quickie failed. If you look uh, today, most of what's on the site, unfortunately, is, is just spam. Similar story with another similar effort, the, the Contiki. Uh, which is another quantum uh, wiki. It also failed for similar reasons. Uh, there's the Knot Atlas uh, for Knot Theory, a wiki for Knot Theory. It also failed for similar reasons. There's the String Theory uh, wiki, which failed, and you can go on and on. There are many examples like this. Another sort of similar promising idea is the idea of a scientific social network. So the idea of kind of Facebook for scientists. Um, uh, not so you can you know, keep track of, of you know, photos of your friends and, and whatnot, uh, but rather a, a way of connecting to other scientists um, who have similar research interests so you can share data, share ideas, and so on. And there are dozens of uh, these uh, sites. I'll just show you uh, a few. Uh, and unfortunately, the story is the same there. They've all essentially failed. And the basic problem is that there's just little incentive for scientists to contribute to sites like this. Why, if you imagine that you're, you're a scientist, why would you share knowledge on a science wiki like, like the Quickie, when first of all, at least early on, they're not, very, they're not really very good. Second, if any knowledge that you share, if you share your ideas or your data, that's actually helping your competitors, right? It's telling them your best ideas. So scientists often try and hoard that kind of information. And third, you won't get any academic credit for it. You can make a whole you know, slew of just brilliant contributions to a site like the Quickie, and it will do much less for your career as a scientist than uh, you know, writing one not very good scientific paper, even though the contributions to the Quickie are actually more scientifically valuable if, if it was a 
you know, really good contributions. So what's going on here is that when you share you know, scientific results, discoveries in journal papers, you're giving something up. You know, you're, you're giving your competitors knowledge, but you're getting a reputational reward as a scientist in return. And that's why it's practical. That's how scientists build the reputation that turn into jobs. But when you contribute to a science wiki, or you share ideas, share data, share code on Facebook for scientists, you're giving something up, but you're not getting a reputational reward in return, because those sites are not seen as, as serious or important. So these new media have great potential for science, but unless there's a reward for contribution, the opportunity cost is leading people to do other things. So what's successful in this kind of environment is projects like the Polymath Project and Galaxy Zoo, which have as their goal conventional scientific ends, uh, in other words, papers, right? So those projects are in some sense, they're, they're essentially conservative. Uh, they're great projects, wonderful projects, uh, but in both cases, the, the final output is actually just conventional uh, uh, papers. And, and, and that's great, but it means that we're missing some big opportunities. Opportunities like the Quickie, which don't actually have a conventional end. The, the out, output from the Quickie is just the Quickie itself. There's no paper at the end of the, the, the trail, unfortunately. So what I'd like to advocate instead, what I think the scientists should do, is they should adopt an attitude of what I call extreme openness. And this means taking all the information that's in their heads and in their laboratories and putting it out on the network. And that means the data in their laboratories, it means their opinions, it means the questions that they have, ideas for research projects, their ideas about how to attack those questions and all the folk knowledge and putting it out on the network. In practice, there are some limitations. Uh, there are practical concerns about privacy and, and ethics and so on. But I believe that openness in some form should be the default. So how can we move to this more open system that I'm advocating? Well, if, if you're, certainly if you're an individual scientist, it seems very daunting to act. The reason why is because if you share ideas and, and so on in non-traditional ways, you're opening yourself up to scooping. I, I, I said before, why would you share your data on the quickie when that will only help your competitors? And, and that is you know, potentially a, a real problem. It's also a problem because even if you very much like the idea of moving to a more open system, just because you're going to, to work on a more open system doesn't mean that you can cause other scientists to, to help out, to, to also adopt the, the, these kind of new approaches. You can't individually cause mass cooperation to break out. I have a, a colleague and, and former student, uh, Tobias Osborne, who tried uh, what's called open notebook science. So actually working completely in the open for about six months on some of his research projects. And he found it difficult going because other people simply weren't willing uh, uh, to contribute. He, he couldn't, you know, as much as he liked the idea, he couldn't cause other people to cooperate with him. And it's precisely that kind of cooperation which is needed. So this seems like an insoluble problem. How can you cause everybody to change their behavior uh, at once? You know, but there are analogous problems in our society which have been solved. Just to think about one problem, you know, everybody in whatever country they live in, drives on the same side of the road. It might be on the right side of the road or the left side of the road. But a single person can't decide to change which side of the road they drive on, right? You can't just cause that kind of change through a, kind of a grassroots uh, initiative. But uh, you know, that doesn't mean that such a change can't occur. In Sweden, in the 3rd of September 1967, at in fact 4.45 in the morning, they changed from the left hand to the right hand side of the road. Uh, this wasn't without uh, problems, uh, that's uh, 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 Sweden uh, on that morning, uh, but they, they got through it, so they did cause this uh, change overall uh, to a new cooperative way of doing things. In fact, a very similar situation arose at the dawn of modern science back in the early 1600s. One of the great scholars of the printing press, Elizabeth Eisenstein, 
uh, makes the comment that it's very strange that scientists weren't using the, the really, they weren't, they weren't publishing very much at this point in time in the early 1600s. The printing press had been around for 150 years and she comments that exploitation of the mass medium, books, was more common among pseudoscientists and quacks than among Latin writing professional scientists who often withheld their work from the press. So instead of publishing it, their, their discoveries, much more typical was the case of Hooke, Robert Hooke, and his publication of Hooke's Law. So let me remind you what Hooke's Law is. It's the one that says if you stretch a spring, it's re the restoring force is proportional to how much you stretched it. So he didn't publish this in the conventional way. Uh, instead, he published in 1676 an anagram, which I've shown here. And uh, he revealed that anagram in 1678, two years later, as the Latin utensio sic vis, meaning as the extension, so the force. And what this meant was that if someone else made the same discovery, Hooke could reveal the anagram and claim the credit without having to share his initial discovery. And unfortunately, Hooke was not at all unusual. Leonardo, Galileo, and Huygens, and many others, Newton, uh, also employed uh, ciphers and, and anagrams. In fact, the whole, the, there's a big controversy between Newton and Leibniz over who invented calculus. And it basically occurred because Newton claimed to have invented it in the 1660s and 1670s, but didn't publish until 20 years later in 1693. So imagine you know, modern biology if uh, the Human Genome Project, instead of publishing the human genome, sort of the base pairs, A, T, C, G, A, T, had instead published them as an anagram. Uh, it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work so well. So you might, might ask, well, why were Hooke, Newton, and, and their contemporaries so secretive? And the problem was, in fact, well, uh, up, up until this time, discoveries were routinely kept secret. It was kind of the, the culture of, of the alchemists. And that secretive culture was a very natural consequence of a society in which there was little personal gain in sharing discoveries. So what happened to change that was that all the big scientific advances at the time motivated patrons, particularly the government, the kings and queens, to subsidise science as a profession. And those patrons knew that the public benefit was st strongest if scientific discoveries were freely shared. So they started to make it that scientists, you know, they, were, they, they would pay the scientists, but they would only pay them if they freely shared those discoveries. Now, it took many decades to achieve uh, this uh, change um, to... Uh, finally, a scientific culture which rewards not the making but rather the sharing of discoveries in scientific journals with jobs and prestige for the discoverer. To give you some idea of, of the situation, you know, in 1662, when Robert Hooke applied to be curator of experiments at the Royal Society, he, he wasn't asked for a record of scientific publications. And the reason why is because the first journals were, didn't appear until three years later, 1665. But about 140 years later, 150 years later, um, the culture had completely changed in science to the point where when Michael Faraday was asked by the young chemist William Crookes what the secret of his success was, he said, work, finish, publish. So by that time, the culture had completely changed. By that time, a discovery not published in a scientific journal was not truly complete. And this was what I like to call the first open science revolution. Really, I think, one of the most important events in, in world history. And it was achieved by subsidising, by paying scientists who published their discoveries in journals. And that's great, that's a wonderful change, incredibly important for us. But unfortunately, that same subsidy today is now inhibiting the adoption of more effective technologies, as we saw. And the reason is because it continues to incentivize scientists to share their discoveries in older media. So how can we solve this problem? Well, that's really a whole other talk and I, I can't give it here today, but I can describe just a partial success today in a little bit of detail. And it's, it's the human genome, in fact, which I, I mentioned before. 
So as you probably know, the human genome data is, is publicly available. You can go online uh, to sites like Entre's uh, Gene and just download the genetic data. And if you think back to, to what actually had to take place, well, you had the data being taken in all these different labs all over the world. They would send it to centralised databases like GenBank, uh, where it was then made available publicly for anybody in the world to download it. If you think of this, the story I've told earlier, this is a bit strange that people do this, that, that this happened, because biologists don't get a whole lot of academic credit when they upload to GenBank. Why would you, as an individual biologist, take the data which you've painstakingly acquired in the lab and then you know, upload it online where anybody can use it, and in particular where your competitors can use it to get a jump on you? You, you gain a competitive and a commercial advantage from keeping your data secret. So, in fact, in the 80, 1980s and 1990s, Biologists worried a lot about this. There was much wringing of hands about, you know, should we share our data, should we not? Every biologist could see that, you know, overall, that kind of information should be publicly shared, but that didn't mean that individually they wanted to share it themselves. So they talked about this for years, and finally there was a meeting convened in Bermuda in 1996. It included many of the leading biologists from the Human Genome Project, it included uh, Craig Venter, who would go on to do an independent uh, uh, for-profit sequencing of the uh, genome. It included people from the big funding agencies who were funding the Human Genome Project. And they came up after several days of discussions with what are called the Bermuda Principles. And these state that any data, genetic data taken, should be released within 24 hours, and also that uh, that information should ultimately be released into the public domain. And it wasn't just a, a group of scientists sitting around you know, chatting. Because they had so many of the leaders there, they were actually able to go back to the big grant agencies, in particular the United States National Institute of Health and the Wellcome Trust in the UK, which were the two big funders of the Human Genome Project, and actually make it into policy there. So if you're a scientist who wants to come along now and work on human genetics uh, you know, at, at that point, you have to agree to abide by the Bermuda Principles. Right? So it was a case where a whole community collectively changed its behaviour from keeping data secret to sharing that data publicly. So th this ultimately was reflected at, at the highest levels. It was endorsed uh, by Bill Clinton and Tony Blair in 2000, and they urged in a joint statement that uh, every country in the world adopt similar principles. So th that's a nice story. Um, and an optimistic one, but unfortunately, it only holds for human genetic data. For many species today, there is no similar agreement. So I was talking to a bioinformatician colleague, and he was saying, you know, this open sharing of data and ideas is great, but uh, it doesn't always work. Uh, I've been working with uh, some colleagues, and uh, they've actually got me, quote, sitting on a genome for an entire year. Right? This was for a whole species of life because there was no analogue of the Bermuda Principles. And if you look at things like uh, the influenza virus, influenza virus, for example, well, there are some initiatives to share data, but even today, uh, most genetic data or much genetic data is not widely shared. So we have this uh, interesting situation. I'll just sort of sum this up. Um, where one way you can get more open sharing of information is, is shown by, by the Bermuda Principle. So it started with individuals, they got together, they made a declaration um, that they would like to cooperate to share data in new ways. This led to a policy which led to every scientist uh, in that area having to abide by those principles. And in fact, this same kind of collective governance idea has been used now several times to lead to more open sharing of scientific information. So in uh, 2008, for example, the National Institutes of Health again in the United States 
um, mandated, the, the, the so-called open access policy. So this is incredibly important. It, it says that if you get money as a scientist from the NIH, which is the world's largest grant agency, $30 billion a year, if you get money, then your uh, papers need to be made publicly available um, I think it's, it's either six or 12 months, I forget now, uh, after they've been uh, published. And so you're starting to see this show up in Google searches and so on. When you do, when you do searches uh, for biomedical information, you'll start to see papers which have been made open access under this open access uh, policy. And a similar idea is now being explored. Uh, it was explored in particular last year. I haven't heard so much this year uh, yet. Uh, but it's still on the table that all US government research uh, will have a similar policy applied to it. That, that's still in the works. So what, what can be done to achieve this more open scientific culture? Well, as we've seen, grant agencies uh, can mandate certain types of sharing, um, like sharing of, of, of uh, 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 data in these ways, potentially sharing of computer code, and they can encourage other types. You can't you know, tell everybody uh, that they need to share their ideas or their questions, but certainly you, you can start to create incentives uh, to do uh, that. So another question is, you know, what, what can be done by individual uh, scientists? And again, uh, this is a, a whole other talk. I will just mention two small things that can be done. Um, and, and that is that you know, as, as an individual scientist, you don't need to spend all of your time working in the open. You can spend just a small fraction of it. And this helps in a couple of ways, partially just the obvious way you are working in the open, but also it helps legitimize working in this way. Uh, you know, you're showing other colleagues that it's okay to, to, to do this kind of work. And second, uh, you could also give credit to people working in the open. That might mean citing things like, say, a blog entry, for example, citing work on, done on a wiki uh, and giving credit in that way. And also, when it comes time to evaluate people for jobs, you can actually you know, look favorably on people who are experimenting uh, boldly with new ways of working. And I think if, if we do these uh, sorts of things and, and, and continue to, to experiment and, and work boldly in this way, we will ultimately, uh, over the next 10 to 20 years, see a second open science revolution, which really complements and completes uh, the first and really changes uh, how science is done. So uh, thank you all very much uh, for your attention. I'll uh, switch over now, uh, away from this and back to the camera view, so I can, well, so you can see me. I've been able to see you the whole time. Thank you.